nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. So our next speaker is Chulju Kim, uh, coming to us today from Postec. So Chulju, we're, we're ready when you're ready. Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, first I'd like to uh, thank the organizers, Aaron, Elif, Sam and Lily uh, for giving us uh, this wonderful opportunity for gathering. And so today my talk title is the uh, Artificial Bundle Wires on uh, Crystals. So before I begin my talk, uh, let me briefly uh, explain and uh, show the where I am. So just to give you the uh, feeling of the traveling, so what we all want in these days. So there, the, our institute is located in the east side of the South Korea, near uh, by the sea. And then, so there's a big steel company, the one of the biggest one in the, um, in the world. And then the, our university is located in the, this uh, suburban area. So really quite, uh, um, quite areas that we can enjoy our science. And then, so, and, and we don't get much snow like the, the Chicago. So, so we, don't, we have less variety here. So, okay, so let me start uh, my talk. So today I will mainly talk, talking about the, the graphene, uh, so which, which is the oldest material in our two-dimensional material community. But still this material, uh, keep surprising us with uh, many newly emerging properties. So I here I brought uh, several examples. So for instance, for electrical properties, uh, people observe the quite robust uh, quantum transport along the spin plus edge state with a relatively weak magnetic field. And you know, optical for optical properties, uh, we people reported the really high harmonic generation uh, up to the ninth orders. So by exciting with terahertz or mid-wave, uh, mid-infrared light, they can e even emit the, the visible, uh, mm -hmm. visible light with a real uh, extraordinary high uh, efficiency that cannot be met with other materials. And also people observe the really giant photocurrent when you shine light onto this undo uh, graphene samples, so, so which cannot be explained by uh, conventional thermoelectric, um, photothermoelectric or photovoltaic events. So all these uh, properties, the exotic properties, are originated from their intrinsic uh, band structures. In a simple, simple picture, uh, this is just a zero band gap semi-metal, which we can find many, many other alternatives. But because of this uh, unique linear band structure with massless Dirac fermion, all these uh, interesting uh, properties can um, can be resulted. And in our group, we are focusing on the materials, so how to prepare this uh, exciting platform. So uh, talking about the platform, the how people uh, the the most standard way of making a test bed. To confirm the ideas, we still uh, rely on, we still using these old exfoliate samples, where uh, you can find a right piece of the plaque with a reasonable effort. So the so if you will look around, you can find a plaque or relative with a size of uh, normally a few tens of a few hundred micrometers, and the fact that we can uh, now grow this material easily up to the wafer scale, keep us to hope that makes something useful out of this, uh, such as like a two-dimensional circuit for computing or like an optical medium with a really efficient non-near linearity uh, that can cover up to from terahertz range to the mid ion But there is a, a big problem is that the, uh, when you generate the signal out of this material, it has a really small cross sections. So after all, is this just a one out of thick material? So the open ex excitation uh, by this ex external stimuli, it can generate only a limited signals. So we absolutely want to increase the volume if we will amplify the signals. But how can you do it? So 
for the flake, it is easy. Simply, you don't explain your sample, explain, explain your sample graphene. Then you just, just use this bulk graphite. Uh, but the making of this uh, uniform multi-layer film structure is not so. It's not as easy as this uh, using this flake. And recently, uh, two groups uh, reported the the, the growth of multi-layer uh, graphene kilns on a engineered uh, conventional copper substrate by forming an alloy. And then people can grow now is the uniform multi-layer films. And does the stacking configuration of this multi-layer film usually follow the most uh, somewhat, somewhat dynamically stable form like the burner stack or rhombohedrons. So for instance, if you are uh, and then in this structure, the constituent layers have aligned crystal orientations. So for the bilayer, for example, this uh, now it has a distinct uh, band structure from the single layer graphene. So it has now uh, this parabolic uh, band structure. And itself, it has some um, can be used for so many uh, things. But the if you wanted to if we want to use this, uh, the intrinsic properties that I just introduced, uh, coming from the, the intrinsic graphene band structures, uh, this sh shouldn't be the way we approach. Uh, and then, so how can you do that? So now the, we need to explain again and then reassemble these materials. But these times, when you reassemble these materials, you can uh, twist the individual layer to give them uh, this the interlayer rotation or angle. So in this way, these constituent layers now can effectively decouple. So for instance, if the, the angle is uh, higher than five degree, for instance, uh, the most of the terra, the low energy regions, it will be more likely, uh, will be effectively decoupled. So now in the momentum space, these two, now in momentum space, now these two uh, Dirac cones from the individual layers are mostly decoupled, except for the certain energy level where uh, it get hybridized, but mostly it will become decoupled. So how can you, uh, how can you make uh, these samples? So the uh, first thing you need is a well-aligned, uh, is a single crystalline, uh, single single crystalline graphene building blocks with a known crystalline line orientation, so we can control the inter, uh, interlay rotation angles. So the most common way people do it is that you take with uh, the one piece of the flake, and then just pick it up the uh, the half of the flake, and and then stack them on top of the others while rotate on um, with the with this twist. Since they are all came from the same crystal, we, uh, we know their crystalline orientation, so we can control these twist angles. So there, the, the important aspect of this approach is that the, this assembly process all done in a uh, dry condition, meaning that so there, the, when you stack these materials, uh, so the, the surface of the individual building glass uh, Will have never been exposed to any chemicals or uh, any chemicals so that the interface can be maintained pristine. But the, the problem of this that is that there is a lack of large scale crystalline building block. That means that, as I mentioned, the typically the size of flake is, on, uh, is below the 100 micrometers. So there, if you wanted to spend multiple layers, it will be really difficult. And then, so for instance, in this limited size, if you excite uh, this uh, material with a terahertz or mid IR range, uh, mid IR, mid infrared uh, light, whose wavelength is exceeding 100 micrometers, then you will get a problem. So there, we need a really big and then um, multiple samples with uh, this twist. So, uh, the, the, these are the basically the bottom lines of my talk today. So I will show you the how we can achieve this uh, wafer scale stack. So this is the optical image of the two inch uh, samples. So you see the, the three stack 
a graphene samples. This one is all done in all dry conditions. So these are the 10 layer stacked samples, cross-sectional TM image shows the really clean interface. And then we can control the twist angle. So the, this is the top view of selective area diffraction patterns with uh, the interlay rotation, with constant interlay layer rotation angle of 10 degrees. So, okay, so the, uh, Again, okay, so to make this a large scale sample, uh, probably we want, um, first thing we need to, uh, we, uh, we need is a crystalline building block, large scale. So a uh, common way to do it is the epitaxial, is the, is the common way to achieve uh, this film is to grow, epitaxial grow this film on uh, the other single crystalline substrate. The common substrate, uh, it's a silicon carbide or copper for graphene. But these materials, there's a problem that it doesn't, uh, they don't match the, the condition required for the, this clean or dry uh, assembly condition. So what I mean by that is the interaction energy between this uh, s grown 2D film and the gross substrate should be weaker than the interaction energy between 2D material, between 2D material so that it can be mechanically exfoliated. But this uh, typical epitaxial growth substrate has an interaction energy with the graphene that is higher than this uh, interlayer interaction between layer two materials. So, so, a, so, that, uh, so therefore, to isolate this s grown large scale 2D film, people t uh, usually chemically etched away this growth substrate. And then the, that leaves uh, so many. Uh, significant substantial decontamination from this uh, the growth substrate element or the hydrocarbon that being exposed on the surface. So the, our starting question, technical starting question was, is there an epitaxial substrate to grow a single crystal graphene but with a really weak uh, interaction with the substrate? So we choose, uh, so, and as a the growth substrate, we choose the germanium substrate. So uh, following the, the previous report, uh, the, we modify the recipe a little bit, and then we get uh, the single crystalline-like graphene. So as you can see in this low energy electron diffraction patterns. So he, as you can see here, so now the graphene armchair direction is aligned to the single crystalline germanium surfaces one-on-one -on -one orientations. So as you can see in these atomic schematics, uh, these armchair directions are aligned to the southern direction of the germanium. But the, the atomic structure of these tools are completely different. Then how can we still be grown epitaxially? So the, so we know that the, in the nucleation, initial stage of the nucleation, uh, this nucleus, uh, Nucleus are not uh, doesn't have a freestanding form, don't have a freestanding form. Instead, they bend it a little bit to be attached to the, the active site of your growth substrate. So you need the energy to bend this material, but still the energy gain you can get uh, by uh, attaching this substrate is huge. So it's much preferred to happen in this way. So for germanium, uh, so for germanium, uh, the the active uh, these edge steps of uh, the people calculated that the, the most stable uh, atomic arrangement is that the, when the, the there are two uh, cases, the either the graphene's armchair is aligned to this edge state or this zigzag uh, edges are attached on this active site, and this one is most uh, stable configurations. But this one's, uh, again, is very uh, sensitive to the growth environment. So if you, for instance, flow too much in methane, the growth precursors, then driving force for the nucleation is too high. So it wouldn't uh, matter this uh, small, uh, this, the energy differences. So the, the zigzag armchair uh, orientation also happen uh, substantially. 
So it should be indeed uh, observed. So with the high methane flow, we observe the two hexagonal diffraction pattern, but only with the very carefully optimized or low methane flow, we can get a single crystal in uh, uh, building blocks. So at a relatively high temperatures. So, okay, so we get this, uh, the well-aligned crystalline orientations, but the, now the, so now the, we wanted to confirm whether it's uh, really has a weak interaction with your gross substrate. And they indeed it show a uh, distinct behavior from the, the typical uh, grown samples on uh, the metallic substrate. So when you deposit uh, another super layer on top of this as grown sample, of a certain thickness, we saw this uh, spontaneous buckling. This is the typical phenomena we observe when this uh, residual strain by the super layer exceeded the uh, interfacial toughness of the weakest inter uh, interface. In this case, the interface between graphene and then the growth substrate germanium. And so by observing this uh, geometry of this buckling, we can estimate the interface energy constant. If this interfacial energy uh, is strong, then they wanted to steer after the spontaneous buckling, wanted to minimize the, this uh, buckled area. And even though they need to uh, buckle, um, bend it, this super layer more. So by observing this, this uh, the geometry, we can estimate the interfacial toughness. And indeed, the estimated value is around 20 to 30 milli electron volt per carbon. It's the lowest among all the other as grown graphene uh, interaction between graphene and other conventional growth substrate, copper, nickel, or silicon carbide. And significantly, this value is lower than the interaction between uh, the, the air materials. So we now we can achieve the, we can try out the, this uh, simple mechanical explanation of s grown graphene films. So, so this is the quick video. So just like the putting the, this uh, thermal release tape on the s grown film, you can easily peel off the full films. So the interaction between these two films are really uh, weak. So now using this as a uh, you know, handling temp handling framework. You can stack on top of the other s grown film and you can simply repeat this process. And then these are the, the wafer scale, the multi step graphene sample image that I showed earlier. And that I want, uh, I want to emphasize that the, the individual step, so the, the, the biggest layer is the first layer we exploited and we pick up the, the smaller pieces in sequence. So I want to put an emphasis on the fact that each layer has these straight edges. So because of they are architecturally grown, the, the substrate has a crystallographically defined straight edges. So based on which we can tell the, the relative crystalline orientation of the individual graphene uh, films. So we can use the, the film grown from the different Substrate even grown from different batches uh, to control the twist angles. So without uh, extra uh, the microstructure characterization, which helps a lot to exceed uh, the process. Then, then the, uh, again, the assembly yield was really high. So this is the optical uh, absorption uh, spectra. So by increasing the, the number of layers, if exactly follow the expected value uh, based on the, the spectra measuring the single layer graphene plate. So it's, the, it's a uniform and then the yield was uh, pretty high, above the 99%. And this means that you can control now number of layer of graphene, uh, which people have been done previously, but this data doesn't mean that we can actually control the, the uh, optically invisible contaminant. So there, we wanted to confirm the fact that this interface is really clean. So with our uh, excellent collaborator, Professor Pin Sharma in UIC, so we look at these uh, multi-layer samples. And then, so in this is the cross-sectional TM image. So uh, you see this, uh, the parallel lines of the graphene. 
So this was the test tech layers. The individual, the interlayer distance was measured to the, the interlayer distance measured in the graphite, similar to the value. And then this is the wide of view of sample. So we don't know. Uh, in some area, there still there is some wrinkles, but the, the most of the area, you get surprised to see that uh, even though it's a uh, stack in the ambient, well, we don't see any noticeable the hydrocarbon contaminant, which uh, uh, is abundant in the wet transport samples. And then, so, uh, and this one is again, it's uh, not uh, the, the naturally occurred uh, synthesized multi-layer graphene is different. So there, if you look at carefully, then, so if you take the pre rate transform of these samples, you can see this, uh, the let signals uh, relate, correspond to the, the lateral periodicity. So if you select this signal and then do the inverse period transform, you get this, uh, the fringe patterns uh, along the lateral in plane directions. And then the, this, uh, the distance is about 2.15 Armstrong. And this kind of the enhanced uh, the contrast can happen by uh, electron channeling when the, this propagating electron beam is aligned to the high symmetric line of your crystals. And indeed, this value is matched with a zigzag line, the interlay, uh, in the, the distance between the zigzag lines in the graphene. And then uh, these lines has a three-layer periodicity. And then this is, uh, is uh, consistent with our stacking configuration. Indeed, in these samples, we keep the, the inter, uh, we keep the interlayer rotation angle as a 20 degrees. So every three layers, it will be the crystal orientation will become identical. So we really are programming this uh, atomic configuration of these uh, multi-stack samples. And then we further confirm the the pristine interface. So with the bigger the the, uh, so further confirm the crystallinity. So these are the X-ray diffraction, um, the XRD. So, and the, the beam size was about centimeter scale. So the, the sample, our samples, the prepared by dry uh, transfers, and so really much higher intensity peak and the, the corresponding interior distance was smaller than the one that was prepared by conventional wet transfers. This one still, we try to thoroughly clean the surface as much as we can. Still, the, the, our sample has a much higher quality. And then based on this full result maximum, we, uh, we converted the, the coherent depths uh, based on these Schroeder equations. And then it is very close to the total thickness of our pillow. So it's really uh, our pillows in over the large scale has a good quality. Uh, we, we wonder this uh, literary distance somewhat higher than the value we observed in the, the natural graphite, but it's, it's understood, uh, it's understandable considering that these are rotated. So in the rotated sample, this literary distance and literary interaction is become weaker and the theoretically it is expected that the distance will, can increase about 10% in a high twist angle. And I think this is the, one of the first uh, experimental measurement of this uh, twisted, uh, interior distance in the twisted uh, uh, sample. So now, uh, so we get uh, pretty confident about uh, the sample fabrication. So we wanted to confirm that really it uh, maintained this original uh, intrinsic uh, band structures. So to confirm that, we conducted the angle leisure photoelectron spectroscopy. So, uh, so for, the, for this test, uh, for this test, uh, we limited the number of samples of the three layers, considering the penetration depth of the the, the photoelectron, emitting photoelectrons. So, for in, in this layer sample, the interior rotation was uh, kept as twenty degree, and then these are the this uh, constant uh, energy map of the the RPS data, uh, you see this diffraction pattern, uh, you see this uh, Iraq points that are rotated by 20 degrees. And then, 
So if you do the cross cut, uh, they are really identical following the, the linear band structure with the, the, just like the single layer of red pins. So it become more clear if you cross cut in this way. So you get this series of uh, Dirac cones. Uh, this one is on uh, some the misoriented lesions. Okay, so even though with the careful optimization, still we have about 10% misaligned lesion by 30 degrees. So this one from the topmost layer, but most, but still the most of majority areas uh, has a the bands, uh, bands uh, Dirac cones at the position that we programmed, and then the 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 bar, the, the weakest. Uh, intensity coming from the, the lowest uh, layers, and then which was affected by the, the, the substrate, but the still the doping level was maintained as low as uh, below the 10 to the, the 11th uh, centimeter square. And this one was uh, not just because they are uh, isolated by anything else. So indeed, uh, still because of their have this pristine interface. Uh, as I show in the earlier slide, you know, the particular energy states where this uh, first band and second band meet or second band and third band meets, they can get hybridized forming these local density of state modulations. So in overall, and but and so in overall, we get you know this uh, high quality multi-layer stack now, vapor scale with a uh, single layer characteristic. So by this point, uh, we wonder whether, so this is the really ideal stacking configuration for amplifying the signals coming from single layer of red pins. So in fact, uh, if you rotate again, the, the twist, twist uh, you can rotate the individual layer more than a five degree, mostly uh, this, uh, mostly the band structure will be uh, decoupled. And then it's like the, any arbitrary angle, uh, height arbitrary angle, most will become mostly the same. But then we can think of the, the some special stacking orders. So it's, so previous slide uh, is this stack in this order. So it's like a helical stack. So everyone is uh, rotated toward the same rotation of polarity. And then these Dirac ones are equally spaced in the momentum space. But now, uh, if we have these uh, alternate stacking orders, then now these two, uh, the even the, the, the even number and the odd number of graphics are exactly overlapped. And then you can see that these, they are, will be more strongly coupled on um, each other. And that can be really important uh, to observe these, uh, all the properties that I showed earlier. And then like the high harmonic generation of, of this in giant photocurrent uh, is strongly affected by the doping level of your individual layers. So it can be either enhanced or suppressed depending on the doping level. So if you want, and then actually tuning this doping level in this atomically thin material is the one of the big um, advantage uh, that we can uh, use. So simply we, to do electrospherically dope your material, you apply a displacement field. And since the, with the limited tension of states, uh, the, the closest layers is cannot fully screen this displacement field. So it's only partially doped. The field penetrates through and dope the second layer and third and so on. So the, uh, so, 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 Starting from the closest one, the doping levels are actually changed, different. And then the theory based on this uh, completely isolated single layer sample, the screen length uh, is depends on the, the total the doping level, but it can be varied from the several times of interlayer distance to the fraction of the diffraction paths. But now, with this one, uh, since this even and other numbers are effectively coupled, now you can imagine that uh, this K can be more evenly, uh, the doping levels can be contributed in this material. So we can dope uh, this material more evenly. So we uh, fabricate such a, a stacking order. So, so this case, this is again RPS data, but the first and third layers are aligned to the same crystalline orientation. 
So they, what we notice, the resolution is not so good. It's nearly preliminary data we get on very recently, but they're, they it maintain the mostly the linear band structures. So in fact, in the, from the theory that the, when two layers are aligned, spaced by this monolayer flake, even though they are aligned, the interlayer interaction energy is orders of magnitude weaker than the, the closer two layer twisted. So, the, so from this, and then it maintained this linear band structure. So there are uh, linear band structures. So there's no, uh, uh, in this alternate stacking order, we can still maintain mostly the linear Dirac structures. But still, uh, the effective uh, capacitor coupling can be different. So for instance, uh, this is the transconductance curve coupled with a dual gate structure with a low twist angle where these two layers more effectively coupled, uh, the doping distribution can be uh, evenly distributed in these layers. So in this case, uh, at a certain uh, doping configuration, they are mostly uh, undoped, both layers, but in a high uh, twisted angle case, the one layer is undoped, the other one can be still doped. And then by changing the, uh, the, uh, the gate voltage, now one side is on top, the other side is stopped. So you can see uh, these two plateau in the high twist angle. And actually recently uh, people, by, by doing this uh, capacitance measurement, people measure this interlayer capacitance in this twist bilayer layer case. And now we are conducting, comparing this uh, two cases of alternative stack and helical stacks of graphene to see how uh, this doping distribution change depending on the different sample behavior. Okay, so I think I'm getting out of time. So uh, let me quickly go through the, uh, this part. So the mostly I'm talking about the, this intrinsic property of the single layer wrapping, but there are peop uh, many people in the field are very excited about uh, looking at this hybrid state uh, with this twist uh, structure. So in this twist structure, you form uh, this Moya pattern, this is like artificial superatoms. And then uh, in this super step, it has a different structure from single layer graphene. It has uh, this simple hexagonal structure with uh, the inversion symmetry. But this one, if you look at the two super, uh, super lattice, uh, this sub, sub lattice point, it has two different stacking configurations. So it has broken inversion symmetry. Therefore, the, uh, with, the, with this hybridized state, we can expect uh, uh, the property that are absent in the single layer graphene, such as like the economic generation, pH electricity, and so on. And then, so I'll just quickly uh, go through this part. And then, so for instance, uh, if you now shine the, the light on the twist by layer graphene, we can observe the second harmonic generations, uh, which was absent in the single layer form. So by changing the incident wavelengths uh, with from 800 to the 1000, we observe the, the doubled, uh, the, the emitting light with the frequency doubled from this fundamental wavelengths, which was again absent in the single layer form. And then, so, and if we found that this uh, output intensity can be maximized in a certain uh, fundamental um, wavelengths. So indeed, this one is we expect is a match with the, the excitation between these hybridized states. So this, so in two drug one is hybridized, it forms these four hybridized states from this second to the third or four, first to the fourth layers are matched with it, these two point maximize uh, this hybrid states. And the interesting thing in this uh, artificial crystal is that not like the, this uh, natural one MOS2, where this harmonic generation happen in all in plane. So the, you shine the light in in plane and you generate the second harmonic generation signal in plane as well. But in this one, indeed our listen work, uh, shows that the, even when you shine the, the outer plane of field, that can be contributed to generate the in-plane of the economic generation signal. And so there, with the 
completely different uh, the optical uh, configuration, like optical fiber, you need to shine the light in an incident angle that can be used for, uh, for the generating this higher much generation signal. Again, since we can stack up to many layers uh, with uh, constructive interference, the signal can be amplified by n square, for instance, if you do the careful uh, stacking configuration matching. So this, um, I'm mainly talking about the electrical property of this artificial layer. But as Jiung just mentioned, you can think about the interaction with this material with other fundamental elements like a heat transport. So, and, or you can put a molecule. So as I mentioned, the interior distance is slightly higher than the natural graphite. So probably putting some ion into this material, like the ions that typically difficult to insert in, in the natural graphite can be done in our artificial graphite. And then it give you a good insight uh, about these properties. And we can stack any other material like MS2 or HBN in the similar sense. So I think we have a much um, variety to uh, work with. So in summary, uh, so the, we, we've been uh, in the nanoscience, uh, we've been mainly play with uh, this capability of the size control. And with this atomically thin films, uh, with a self-passivating interface, so we can control this, uh, this size in an atomic scale. Uh, and that can be done by a uh, self-assembly process very effectively. But with now this artificial assembly, not only we side control this uh, size of your material, but we also can control the shape of the material and we can explore uh, more uh, properties of this. So again, uh, this done work done by uh, the many, uh, with the help of the many collaborators. So the Dr. Uh, Chang Kwang from the Huang Accelerator Laboratory, uh, help you with the RPS measurement. Uh, Professor Pin Shen Huang in UIUC help you with the TM characterization. And Kim Jong Han uh, in post tech help you with uh, this harmonic generation experiment. And these are the group members and the, the, the data that I showed uh, today is mostly done by uh, my excellent uh, student, uh, Song Jun Yang. And these are the, the, the funding sources. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Cholju. Uh, thank you for this wonderful presentation. I think we have a couple questions here. Ah, David. Hi, so uh, Cholju, thanks very much for the, um, the beautiful results. Um, and I, I had a couple of questions just about the um, mm -hmm. practical aspects of what you were doing. And then I had um, also um, a question about the resulting properties of the material. So um, in terms of the process, do you pick up successive layers directly with the already picked up graphene layers as, um, as Ji Wong was describing for the uh, TMDCs? Or are you picking up each layer with thermal release tape and then um, moving it over um, and releasing the tape? Oh, the, so the, the first, uh, in the, uh, the, we done it in a formal way. So the, the, we pick up all the layers, uh, we pick up all the layers. So it's just, the, the, we follow, uh, it's the same as the, 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 the instruction that Jiung mentioned. So the, just like MS2, we pick up the first layer and then use it as another pickup layer. Great. So it's the same, it's the same as the explicit sample. Great. So, so, um, um, so then maybe just in the interest of time, I'll ask about the, the, um, the resulting properties. So you, uh, you, talk, you, you showed that the crystalline orientation is pretty well defined based on uh, the ARPIS measurements. Uh, I wondered whether uh, uh, you could quantify that further. Um, you mentioned that the doping was low, uh, about 310 to the 10. Um, and I wondered whether there are other metrics you've checked for lateral uh, inhomogeneity. Uh, so in terms of the doping level or like... Uh... Well, no, I mean, any, um, the, you, you've built a new crystal. Um, mm. And uh, so just as examples in Ji Wong's talk, he showed... Mm. Um, uh, he showed uh, diffraction patterns, but um, I'm just asking what what you know about the um, mm -hmm. uh, nature of any lateral disorder in this um, 
Uh, oh, I see, I see. So the, uh, we haven't done any atomic scale of uh, the characterization from the like the like the, the reconstruction that Jung observed in uh, this uh, helical structure. We haven't done careful measurement uh, on this our multi-layer sample, but in a general sense about the sample uniformity. Uh, for instance, uh, this one is showing this uh, the specially reserved optical uh, spectroscopy, where this uh, we can see this uh, extra absorption peak that is uh, the correlated the twist angle setters, and then during within this map uh, we can get uh, this uh, the control angle of uh, plus minus uh, one plus minus one degree you know, like centimeter scale. So that was the- Great. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, wonderful. So thank you again, Chul Ju.